lecture this evening. Uh, I, uh, we are very pleased to welcome Franka Miriam Brickler from the Department of Mathematics and uh, Vladimir Stilinovic from the Department of Chemistry. Both of them uh, are uh, very active and enthusiastic about science popularization, uh, either mathematics or chemistry, as we shall see tonight. So, uh, so the the title the title of their talk uh, today will be from bathroom tiles to quasi crystals chemical applications of normal tessellation so franca and vladimir please so thank you for the introduction so as you see you will see many nice pictures from us and maybe you will learn how math appears in chemistry you may know or not know that everything starts with mathematics, even bathroom tiles. In fact, in this case, it all began in Greece. Several hundreds, in fact, thousands of years ago, Pythagoreans, people gathering around Pythagoras, noticed that there are only three types of regular polygons that can tile the plane. And they no gave a proof that in, more mo in modern notation would look like that, but of course they didn't write it like this. In fact, it was just simple elimination. They count, uh, considered the possibility of arranging a regular n gon m pieces around one corner, and then considered what, what will happen. So we, as the title says, we meet tilings every day when we go to the bathroom or when we look at a floor like this one here. When we are in the bathroom, we should consider what a tiling or tessellation really is. From a mathematical standpoint, it's a countable, so that means infinite, a family of tiles. Tiles are closed sets. For the purposes of this, I must apologize to all true mathematicians. I will say that a uh, set is closed if it contains its edge. It's not a precise definition, but it will serve all we need here. So to have a tiling, we want to have no gaps because it would be highly impractical i.e. the union of all tiles must be the whole plane or space. You know, we can have three-dimensional uh, three uh, tiles also. We will meet them later. And we also don't want tiles to go, well, somehow like this, so because we would fall down when walking on such a floor, i.e. we want a pack, so-called packing, or in formal notation, we want that the interiors of such tiles do, do not intersect. Uh, while you are so sitting and considering your tiles in your bathroom, you can start thinking about the generating set. In most cases, we have a generating set consisting of only one tile. A generating set is a set of representatives in so far that no two tiles in it are congruent. And these tiles that live in the generating set are called prototiles. To help everybody imagine what this means, let look, uh, let's look at this very nice tiling, which looks somehow regular, and it's still not really regular. It's known as the Fibonacci tiling. And if you look closely, of course, ignore the colors. They are, don't have anything to do with mathematics. You could notice s several smaller squares or congruence. So we have one prototile that's a small square. We have the bigger squares. This is the second prototile. And the third prototile would, in this case, be a arbitrary, not completely arbitrary, but a, a not a square, but a how is it called? Still a pravokutnik? Rectangle. Rectangle. Yes, I knew uh, some word will be missing in my. Well, most of us want to have normal tessellations, and you won't believe it, but in fact, in mathematics, when I say normal tessellation, is also what a chemist would consider normal. You, it's no, no, normally when you have mathematics, and they say that something is easy or trivial. It's Usually not obvious. But here, by normal, we mean that we do not want to have tiles with holes. It's e much easier to achieve by drawing a declaration if we really want to have this effect. We don't want to have tiles that intersect in a disconnected set like here. Again, if we really want such declaration, then we can draw it. We don't have to make such crazy tiles. And we do not want to have a tiling where the tiles become infinitely smaller and smaller and smaller like here, or bigger and bigger and bigger like you can imagine going to the outside. So in all of the rest, I will only speak about normal tilings. 
And especially about such tilings like this. What we need notice right away is a regularity here, which can be described, since this is like a tiling of a plane, that we can go in two non-parallel directions, walking, for example, along this line in equally spaced steps that are, for example, of this size, and we will always have the left and right-hand side looking the same. But we can go also in another direction like this, and the same thing will happen. Such tilings will be called periodic. We meet tilings not only in bathrooms and kitchens, uh, but also in pavements, in art, especially ornamental art in the Middle Eastern countries, or mosaics, and in nature, for example, when you see beehives, or crystals. And I believe this is where I come in. Yes. So now it's time to say something about the chemical side of the thing. Well, of course, bathroom tiles are made of some chemicals, but that's not what we are going to talk about. Uh, crystals are something a bit more interesting. <laughs> now, uh, when you look at crystals, when you think about crystals, you usually think about something which is nice, shaped like nice polyhedron. So something like this, or something like this, or something like this. And uh, now all these uh, are crystals of common salt, but crystallized in different, from different, uh, in different, uh, in bar from different solvents from different environments. You are not hurt well. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. So, some more salt. Well, then we have some other crystals, and uh, then we can have little flat crystals. Then we can have nice octahedral crystals. We can have uh, crystals when one uh, substance can crystallize in different ways, so then we can have a little green rhombus and little green blades, then we can have orange crystals, and we can have small crystals, and we can have large crystals, and we can have all sorts of <laughs> crystals. And we always expect to see a regular shape from the outside. Now, uh, what uh, is perhaps you're wondering, what does that have to do with uh, tessellations, with tilings? You know, it's just uh, you know, polyhedra. Well, uh, it's uh, what they look like uh, inside. It's uh, what matters. You know, we, it's not just on the outside. They are also nice on the inside. It must well, be near to you. Oh, so it must be really this near to me. Yes. Okay. Otherwise, uh, they won't hear you if you are walking over the internet. Okay, so I'll try it at least. So anyway, crystals are comprised of atoms, of molecules, of whatever, and these atoms, molecules, they take up some space. And then we can say that actually the crystal is uh, comprised, is tiled by, the space tiled by molecules is what makes crystals. So if we look what they... Uh, so uh, we were talking about periodicity. Well, uh, that is something that is also connected with crystals. Uh, from the earliest ideas, what crystals might look in, like inside, people were thinking about, well, we have atoms, atoms are probably some little spheres, and if we put them together, we might get all sorts of different shapes. Uh, for instance, this is from uh, Hooke's Micrographia, and he was thinking how we can put little balls and make uh, all sorts of shapes we see in crystals. So uh, when you look at these uh, balls, you see that they are actually stacked, uh, they are densely packed, and they are periodical. But uh, he did, no one actually noticed this periodicity as something important until late uh, 18th century, when René Juste uh, was making experiments uh, on uh, calcium carbonate. So he was taking all sorts of crystals of calcium carbonate, which can look, uh, those crystals can be of any shape and size, and he was hitting the, those crystals with a hammer. And uh, what he realized is that uh, no matter what the crystal originally looks like, when it breaks up, the pieces look like this. <laughs> so uh, he concluded that most likely uh, crystals are actually comprised of uh, such little polyhedra which are periodically then repeating throughout the space. And he was uh, then made models, calculated uh, the angles between uh, crystal faces based on those little polyhedra and he realized that it is, it is really what we see. Uh, now this of course remained uh, a supposition for a long time until 101 years ago when uh, Laue, Friedrich and Knipping made an experiment. They should have shown crystal to be a diffraction grating for x-rays. And uh, this is generally considered as the proof of uh, periodicity of crystal structures. Proof, but not in a mathematical sense. Yes, it's proof in our sense. We are less picky. 
So uh, anyway, uh, today we can make uh, nicer pictures uh, of the same uh, thing and we can see that uh, really we have nice diffraction images uh, made from crystals. So uh, this, uh, di this diffraction actually allows us uh, to solve crystal structures. Based on these diffraction images, we can see how atoms are combined in crystals, uh, how they are placed in 3D, and uh, then so we can actually calculate the positions of atoms in crystals, and we get nice little pictures such as these. Well, it's not too big picture. Well, anyway, I think you need some more precise notions here, because I see that we are generally talking about the same thing when I was having, it's on. Uh, when I was showing the pictures of the tilings, well, that are more artistic, so I will stick to your story. So we need a more formal approach to say what periodicity is. So in fact, it is just like repeating a duck in equal spaces, so very regularly and ad infinitum. Uh, we say that an object possesses translational symmetry if we can find a vector, so, so called, a we can also call it a shift. So when you shift the object, for that vector, you don't see any difference. So if our ducks were in infinite row, if you shift them for one vector that is now should be see, uh, visible up, up on the left, then the whole row will look like the same. In formal notation, you see how it would look like, but it's not really that necessary to have the formal notation. More important is that we will say that an object is periodic if we can find as many vectors that are independent, let's leave this now undefined, as is, the, uh, as is the dimension of the space, so that shifting in all of the one, two, three, or more directions doesn't change the look of the object. So in 2D, like it was illustrated before, we need two non-parallel directions. In 3D, we need uh, three directions that are not parallel to the same plane. And of course, in 4D, it would be more fun, but we, can sh we cannot show it. Of course, you may have noticed that I said we need to have some vectors, if I said that. But we or if we, you have a periodic, periodic structure, or picture, or whatever you want to call it, then the choice of these vectors is never unique. For example, if you shift this picture for just a small horizontal vector, it will look the same, but it will look the same also if you sh shift it for this vector. So you will always have more than one choice, in fact, infinitely many choices, of which vectors to you use to represent the periodicity. So let's find some consequences if, of being periodic. First of all, you must be infinite, otherwise you would notice after the shift that something is missing. So I think that's the only small problem with crystals. They are not really infinite. But is it a real problem? Well, no, it's not really a problem because uh, if you look at the crystal and you think of a crystal something you know, roughly yay big and uh, you think about atoms which are, you know, incy wincy very small, then uh, from, the cr from the atom's point of view, and if the atom is sitting somewhere in the middle of the crystal and, it's, and the atom is looking around itself, uh, what it sees is uh, infinite row of atoms. Okay, so the atoms have infinitely good vision in contrast to people. Great. Well, anyway, also what we can no notice that what I already said, we can describe the periodicity by an infinite number of choices of these vectors representing the periodicity. And if we fix these vectors, we usually call them crystallographic basis if we are speaking about 3D and want to use it for describing structures, then we can define something called a lattice. You can imagine having one point and all the positions you can get from it by shifting it for these vectors. Uh, if somebody likes mathematical notation, one can also say that these are all points with integer coordinates in the corresponding coordinate system. Uh, now, we crystallographers, we prefer pictures. So uh, this is a, a picture of a crystal structure. You imagine that all these balls are little atoms. And uh, so now we choose one atom. Let's say this, uh, that green, green round thing over there. And then we look at uh, where it repeats uh, in space, and we see that uh, an identical, identical atom repeats in, you know, we are looking now in two dimensions, of course, you know, it's repeating all over the place. Now, if we look at these points, uh, which were defined by the position of this atom, we see indeed that we have a lattice, so a bunch of points uh, which correspond to 
translation equivalent atoms. Maybe I could first switch on my microphone. So if we choose a basis that represents the periodicity, we can also define something used, uh, usually called the unit cell, which consists, mathematically speaking, of all the points that have coordinates between zero included and one excluded. But I think you will give a more picturesque yeah. definition of this. Well, uh, the one thing that uh, we can note this uh, when we this, when we define such a uh, uh, unit cell, we actually get uh, another type of tile. So we don't have to now look at crystal as something which is uh, made up of molecules, but like some, something that is made up of unit cells, where each unit cell is actually a tile. And uh, when we think about it, each unit cell is a uh, parallelepiped, and it is uh, something very much like that uh, which was thought of by IE 200 and some years ago. So he was really a smart fellow. But now, um, a problem which arises is that, uh, as you said, uh, we have an infinite number of vectors which we can use to define the periodicity. So, uh, w how can we choose the unit cell? So, we can, for instance, in this uh, picture of a crystal structure, we can use define this unit cell, or we can define this one, and we can define this one, and the question is which is the right one, or is there a right one? Uh, for practical reasons, one does need uh, some sort of uh, some sort of a convention to say which one we shall choose, and uh, the answer is we always choose the smallest one, which which depicts correctly the symmetry of the crystal. So in this particular case, uh, it's not quite easy to see, but uh, the uh, the most uh, the the highest one would be the correct choice. Da, pomaklo, jesi, sad čuje, mislim da sam pomakla ovaj. Is it now okay? I switched again the... You asked me to switch it on and off, it's not so easy. So anyway, <laughs> so now, now everybody will hear the, the more serious part, which is more important than the non-so serious part. Uh, the thing is that ma in mathematical sense, uh, the non-translational symmetries, i.e. the symmetries that do not include translations, are isometric linear operators, i.e. orthogonal operators, which also means that if you use a matrix to represent it, the matrix must have determinant 1 or minus 1. And for example, to be a rotation, you must have a determinant 1. So the, this would be a, let's say, abstract definition of rotation. But Euler has proven somewhere in the 18th century that at least for 3D, it is what one would expect from a rotation. So to classify rotational symmetries, which are, not so, which are often not so easy to see as the mirror symmetry, one often uses the na name of sim ro symmetry order. So if you can turn an object around an axis, for example, this here around the axis going perpendicularly to the screen, and in this case for a third of the full angle, then we speak of rotational symmetry of order three. So these are representations of objects with rotational symmetries of order orders, I beg your pardon, two, three, four, and five. Uh, well, so, uh, this is... Uh, this is something which is rather interesting uh, in crystallography because uh, in crystals we can only see some types of rotational symmetry. Uh, to be more precise, we can have or 
other, um, we can have rotations, the first or the second, third, fourth, and sixth, but uh, no other. Okay, and we can prove it, that you are, your vision is okay, not only your atoms, but also the crystallographers. There is a relatively simple proof for two-dimensional periodic things that one can use to say, to show why other rotational symmetries are impossible. Imagine you have a lattice with a rotational symmetry. Let's the, let these two points be the two closest points in the lattice. Then if you take a rotation of that lattice, which is of other orders than one, two, three, four, or six, in this picture, a rotation of order five, you will rotate one point of the lattice to this position, the other point of lattice to that position, and you will always notice that you will get two points that are near than the nearest possible solution. In 3D, one can do that, but also, but it's slightly more complicated, so most mathematicians would prefer the matrix proof, because every rotation around the axis can be represented by such a matrix, if we take the axis to be a z-axis. In that case, the matrix has trace two cosinus phi plus one. On the other side, if we uh, represent the same rotation in a basis corresponding to the crystallographic uh, coordinate systems, i.e. where the lattice points have integer coordinates, the matrix would have only integers in it, so the trace must be an integer, since it's an invariant, and then it's easy to see that the only five possibilities are those that you can enumerate. Of course, why restrict ourselves only to two and three dimensions? So the crystallographic restriction functions also in higher spaces, only there are a little bit more freedom. For example, in dimension four, you may have a rotation of order five, but not of order 11. So I think it would be good to have a system to enumerate all the possible symmetry combinations or one math mathematician would say groups that consist of the symmetries. In 1D, we have seven so-called freeze groups that are classified, for example, this one has both horizontal and vertical mirror lines and can be also rotated for uh, 180 degrees. The first one has only translational and symmetry and nothing else, and these are all the seven types. And you can meet, meet them in many places. For example, the one is above is of the best maximal order of symmetry, uh, maximal type of symmetry in, uh, among the freeze groups, while this one doesn't have the rotation and also doesn't have a horizontal uh, plane. In 2D, there are, of course, more possibilities. These are just a few examples. You check, besides for translational symmetry, what, con what you can do with it, for example, if you can rotate it for some order or something. And it is not too complicated to prove. I think many, or I hope that many of students of mathematics would be able to prove that there are 17 so-called wallpaper groups that classify this. And there are, of course, tables that help non-mathematicians to find their way among those well, wallpaper groups, for example, if they want to uh, refurnish their walls at home. So when you look at this picture, you concentrate on what is the maximal order of symmetry. It's quite easy to see that the maximal sy symmetry order is three. And if there are mirror lines, so, okay, maximal order of symmetry is three. We have mirror lines, and then we only have to check if there are centers of symmetry on the mirror lines or also off. In this case, all centers of symmetry are on mirror lines, so this is a P3M1. I'm not, I'm not sure who is responsible for the notation. Uh, I think you are more interested in 3D than in 1 and 2D. So in that case, there are 230 groups, and I think this was not proven by a mathematician. No, this was actually first proven by a uh, crystallographer mineralogist, Yevgraf uh, uh, Stepanovich Fyodorov, uh, somewhere around the 1870s, 80s, something like that. Yeah, but again, why stop at three dimensions? So I think mathematicians that did the rest. So, for example, in six dimensions, you have almost 29 millions of sp space, six dimensional space groups. Maybe you can use it at some point. I really doubt it. Uh, anyway, uh, all these uh, 230 space groups have actually been seen uh, in actual crystals. Today we know almost one min million uh, crystal structures, and uh, there has been at least, uh, for each space group there is at least one. 
Uh, so we do see different, for instance, we have symmetry of fourth order in crystals, and we have uh, You won't show 230 order. pictures? Uh, no, I won't show 230 pictures. Uh, an interesting thing is that uh, they are not all occupied equally. For instance, all of these 230 space groups, one accounts for almost one-third of all crystal structures. So that wow. one is very favorite among crystals. Is it a high symmetry or a low it's symmetry? Actually very, usually these high symmetry groups are less populated. You know, molecules usually have very low symmetry, so they like low symmetry environments. Oh, they like to be non-perfect. Well, anyway, what one can see more or less from the previous talk is that when one thinks about periodic uh, tessellations or tilings, mathematically it, everything has been said. You know, we know their properties, we can classify them, we know most mostly everything about them. They are interesting for non-mathematicians, but less for mathematicians at the moment. But in mid-20th century, mathematicians started to investigate the non-periodic tilings, and among them, they started to think about those tilings that are almost periodic, so almost regular, but not quite completely regular. So they called such tilings quasi-periodic, by meaning that every part of this tiling can be found somewhere else in the same tiling, but not in a regular repeating way like in periodic tilings. And they started a search for quasi-periodic sets of tiles, i.e. for tiles that can tile the pla plane only periodically. So, uh, uh, periodically, I beg your pardon. And the first such set was found in 1966 by Robert Ice. I'm not sure from which nation he is, I will say Berga, but, and I apologize if he is, for example, French. Uh, his set of prototypes was, as you see, quite big. But very soon after that, smaller sets of prototypes were found. One of the most famous ones are Robinson's six prototypes that you can see here. But definitely the most famous set of uh, tiles was found by Sir Roger Penrose, who first mo found also a six-membered set of uh, quasi-periodic prototypes, and then the two-membered set of famous Penrose tiles. Uh, you can see how they look like, like how they look there or how they look here. This is Professor Bob Butzat from Australia, a very famous professor in chemical education. Uh, there are two types of Penrose prototypes. Two, one is this rhombi, the other one looks like a kite and an arrow, but here we only have representations of these. And, for example, there are many, many interesting mathematical properties of these Penrose tilings. Uh, each Penrose tiling has a center of symmetry of order five. This is how we know it's not periodic. Uh, every part of every Penrose tiling can be found in other Penrose tilings. For example, if Bob Butzat from the previous picture had landed in a land which is infinitely uh, tiled with Penrose tiles, he wouldn't be able to identify in which Penrose tiling he landed. Also, there are infinitely many of them, but there is a small problem. We need rules, because with the same tiles, as you see them here projected, one could do the thing also periodically. So, yeah, it's quite obviously possible, and I hope Vlado will show you, that it, one could also tile it periodically. So, we need a rule how to match the tiles, which can be described usually by colors, or maybe by arrows, or by indents, like in a puzzle or something. Uh, anyway, soon after Penrose's discovery, two years later, in fact, Robert Amann, a hobby mathematician, found a 3D version of the, same, of the Penrose tiling, and by, after seeing that, uh, Penrose wrote to a very, very famous and probably the most famous popularizer of mathematics, Martin Gardner, in fact, the guy who later popularized the Penrose tilings, a uh, very interesting conjecture, saying, I will read it whole, it is just possible that these things may have some significance in biology. You will recall that some viruses grow in the shapes of regular dodecahedra and icosahedra. It has always seemed puzzling how they do this. But with Amman's non-periodic solids as basic units, one would arrive at quasi-periodic so-called crystals, involving such seemingly impossible, crystallographically, cle cleavage directions along dodecahedral and icosahedral planes. Is it possible that the viruses might grow in some such way involving non-periodic basic units, or is the idea too fanciful? At that moment, it really seemed it was a fanciful idea. We had absolutely no proof that something like that really happens. But, again, mathematicians were prophetic. 
Uh, yes, uh, actually, even before this, people were starting thinking, uh, why would all things always have to be periodical? We could have uh, highly symmetric, we could have highly ordered structures which are not periodical. And uh, for instance, people are thinking about things such as these. You can have a group of atoms, which is actually makes a, so a body of very high symmetry of icosahedral symmetry. It is not periodical, yet it is uh, also not, uh, it, it is, uh, it is uh, highly structured. And uh, for a while this was uh, only theoretical until 1982, uh, when uh, Dan Schechtman, uh, an Israeli scientist then working in America, found uh, a alloy which uh, shown, has shown it was diffracting radiation, so it was it seemed to be crystal, but uh, the diffraction image had un not unallowed, uh, that for forbidden symmetry of uh, order 10. And uh, over, year, over several years later, uh, people managed to grow larger crystals, so larger, subs uh, larger, well, larger crystals, we can say, of such, uh, such alloys, and these crystal, these really look like crystals. They are polyhedral and uh, everything like that, but uh, they have strange shapes, such as regular dodecahedra. So such things uh, were then called quasi-crystals or quasi-periodic crystals, because it was uh, assumed that they might have a quasi-periodic structure. Yes, and in fact, we already saw today something quasi-periodic in a previous talk where we had some pulsations that were quasi-periodic. And mathematicians have discussed quasi-periodicity much earlier than the quasi-periodic tiling in the sense of functions. In fact, somewhere in 1920s or 30s, where the brother of Niels Bohr, Harald Bohr, also a good footballer, uh, generalized the theory of periodic functions to the theory of quasi-periodic functions. And one can imagine quasi-periodicity like this. In the picture, in the first picture, you can see a typical periodic function that is made up by adding one sine and one cosine function with different periods, but the, relation, the ratio of the periods is a rational number. If the ratio of their periods is not a ra rational number, like in the second case, you get a quasi-periodic function. But if you change a variable, one of these, and represent this in 2D, you have a periodic two-dimensional function. So in some, in some sense, this one-dimensional quasi-periodic function is a section through this two-dimensional periodic one. So in fact, one can imagine a tri-dimensional quasi-periodic thing to be a section of something that is periodic in six dimensions. So that was why we are talking, already mentioning the six dimensions. Oh, to round everything up, let's see what's happening now, because maybe some are now thinking it's all from a mathematical po point of view just a game with tiles, and crystallography is anyway not mathematics, so what, why would this be interesting? So there are several uh, interesting things happening. As I told already, there are so, so far all known sets of quasi-periodic prototypes require a matching rule. So, so far, nobody knows if there is a set of prototypes that can ma uh, tie the plane only quasi-periodically, but without requiring any matching rule. On the other side, there has been one found, a one-member generating set, so with only one prototype, a hexagonal, but it also need, needs a matching uh, rule. Also, of course, as typically mathematician, we also advance to higher dimensions. There are also highly abstract concepts in typo topology, differential equations, and so where quasi-periodic structures are discussed. But just that you get a uh, feeling these are, from the last year, the published articles on quasi-periodic tilings. So you can see that they are also published in the computer science papers, because also one can try to do some simulations there. Or in topology and applications, and maybe also in physics and such things. And what's happening in chemistry or, let's oh, say, real sort, life? All sorts of things. Uh, this is the first page out of many out of, of papers published in uh, chemistry, physics. So you work more than we do. Well, uh, anyway, uh, 
last couple of years is particularly uh, much work has been done. Uh, uh, Schechtman was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry two years ago for his uh, discovery of quasi-crystals. And uh, so today uh, there is lots of work on synthesizing new quasi-periodic uh, substances and uh, in determining their, their structures. What do they actually look like inside? We are not entirely certain of that still. Yes, and we also have the problem that we do not, it's obvious that the Penrose styling is not a good model bec exactly because of these matching rules. So there is also one reason, that is also one reason why we search for prototypes without matching rules. So I think it's time to end this, as Croatians would say, urevialnom tonu. So we wish you a Merry Christmas. Oh, you thought of everything. <laughs> I always think yeah. of everything. I'm a mathematician. So. And we wish to say goodbye to this old mathematics of planet Earth year. Yes, and hello to the new International Year of Crystallography, which is next year as 100th anniversary of the first Nobel Prize uh, given for crystallography. So we thank you for your attention. Excellent, uh, excellent lecture. Are there some questions or comments? Or actually, I suggest that uh, we pass to to short uh, break, and then we'll uh, we'll have a round table, and we can discuss ev every uh, every every lecture. So uh, please, uh, I would just like to thank uh, all the speakers, uh, and we'll continue in a short time.